Alexei Navalny is dead. Like so many mysterious deaths in Putin's Russia, Navalny's was unsurprising, yet somehow shocking. For the last decade, Navalny has been the only real democratic challenger to the Russian dictator, who has ruled Russia since 2000. And for that, for the crime of advocating for democratic reform in his country, Navalny faced many assassination attempts over the years. In 2017, disinfectant was thrown in his face, causing damage to his right eye. In 2020, he was attacked with a Novichok nerve agent during a flight from Tomsk to Moscow. He managed to get airlifted to Berlin, where he spent several months recuperating. Despite all this, Navalny returned to Russia in January 2021, knowing full well he would be arrested and sucked into the Russian penal complex. He knew he was never going to come out. Ten days before Navalny's death, right-wing media personality Tucker Carlson interviewed Putin, Navalny's nemesis, in a two-hour conversation at the Kremlin. They talked about a lot of things, the war, NATO, China, and Putin gave a half-hour-long ahistorical rant about how Ukraine is an illegitimate state. The name Alexei Navalny never came up. Shortly after that interview, Tucker appeared on stage at the World Government Summit in Dubai to talk about the U.S.-Russian relationship. Tucker was asked why he hadn't pressed Putin about Navalny, to which he replied, Every leader kills people. Some kill more than others. Leadership requires killing people. Sorry. He preferred, you see, to talk about how wonderful the Russian capital was, how it was so much, nicer, so much nicer than any than city in, in my country. country. All on stage in a country that runs on indentured servitude and sharply curbs freedom of expression. It is so much cleaner and safer and prettier aesthetically. It's architecture, it's food, it's service than any city in the United States, Tucker said of Moscow. How did that happen? Well, that's easy. 500 people possess three quarters of Russia's wealth, and almost all of them live in the center of Moscow. It should be noted that this wealth was not created the way wealth is created in modern countries. It was mostly stolen from the wreckage of the Soviet state, then repackaged as serious-looking companies in steel glass towers that would fit snugly into New York or London. The magnates who own these companies don't really own them the way people own companies in the United States, built with grit and gumption and creativity. They own them so long as the Kremlin lets them own them. Whatever power they exercise is really an extension of Kremlin power. Just ask Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the former Yukos Oil CEO, one of the few Russian billionaires to fall out of grace with Putin and survive. Barely. In 2003, Russian agents arrested Khodorkovsky aboard his private plane. He spent the next decade in prison. All of which is to say the center of Moscow is a bitter Potemkin joke. But Tucker, in his two-hour interview with Putin, which has so far racked up more than 200 million views on X, failed to reveal any of that. Now, in a healthy democracy, if we still were one, Americans would recognize such a double stunt, granting a sycophantic interview to a supervillain and then trashing the United States and praising Russia while on stage in Dubai? That should surely be greeted with condemnation, shame, or both. But we don't appear to live in that country right now. Instead, Tucker's interview was greeted with applause by many on America's new right. Betty Johnson, a Republican YouTuber with more than 2 million followers, proclaimed this. Tucker may literally bring peace to the world with this interview. And lies create war and slavery. The truth shall set you free. And then there was Joey Manorino, a podcaster, who told his followers that he'd take Putin over Biden any day of the week. This is the Rubicon that, until recently, no sane American would have dared to cross. Yes, the President of the United States is doddering and tired, and he's definitely not sharp. But he's also not a former KGB agent suspected of having blown up a Moscow apartment building, sparking the Second Chechen War and securing his rise to power. He's not evil. And until recently, most semi-intelligent people would have agreed about this, even if they voted for the other guy. But now the great tsunami of stupid has swept the nation. Conservatives, just like progressives before them, are unthinkingly condemning all things America. Because America, you see, is rotten, bankrupt, over. One of the ways you understand a society is through its infrastructure. To underscore this point, by the way, Tucker posted a video of the Moscow Metro meant to show how neat and orderly things are there compared to New York City. 
Now, the way each camp, the left and the right, arrived at their own species of anti-Americanism was different, of course. For the left, there was always something repugnant about the inequities and unfairnesses of democratic capitalism, and above all, of course, America. For the right, it was the fall from grace, the loss of virtue, and the betrayal of the American dream by a corrupt elite. But all is not lost. It turns out that, to win over the American right, all you have to do is give them a dose of homophobia and misogyny. All you have to do is say that you're anti-woke and that you're defending your borders, your people, and all is forgiven. Putin, of course, whose power relies not on human capital but energy reserves, could not care less about the Russian people. He has recast Russia as the great white Christian redoubt, the antidote to the progressive identitarian corporate complex that has co-opted so many American institutions. And American right-wingers are so eager to demolish their political foes that they will cheer on someone, anyone, who would literally do just that. If only he were the American president. What they don't grasp is that the strong man is the opposite of strong. He fears the media, the opposition, elections, a free internet. He most definitely feared Alexei Navalny. Putin is hardly a visionary saving civilization from the illiberal left. He is a shirtless Don Corleone riding horseback while shooting Siberian tigers. He is an enemy of civilization, a warden of the deepest of deep states. We know why so many on the American right are confused. They have been engulfed by a tornado of tribalistic furies. They have succumbed to the same idiocy and myopia that grips so many progressive identitarians. The same ones who believe that the October 7th attack on Israel was a noble rejoinder to colonization. So many on the American right are convinced that demolishing the Biden administration at the cost of cheerleading and empowering Vladimir Putin is not a moral front, but a triumph for rational people everywhere. America is as confused as ever. And that's exactly what the Kremlin wants. It counts on our muddle-headedness, our hot takes, our slapdowns, our hashtags and denunciations of our fellow Americans. The Kremlin requires ignorant or opportunistic outsiders to legitimize that which is illegitimate. Which is why it was very happy to invite the former Fox News host to the inner sanctum. While Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, who, unlike Tucker, would have known what to ask Putin, sits in a Russian prison cell. And Alexei Navalny, Russian democracy's last best hope, waits to be buried. Navalny once said this, If they decide to kill me, then it means we are incredibly strong, and we need to use that power and not give up. We don't realize how strong we actually are. Navalny died for the sake of truth. Tucker fell for the lie.